So our session one is prevention through design from a UK perspective. And I'm going to introduce our moderator. Our moderator for this session is Scott Ernest. Uh, Scott works at NIOSH. He's had a long career in the military. Um, he's uh, published extensively around prevention through design. Um, he's a licensed civil, in, he's a licensed engineer and a CSP and has a PhD in uh, mechanical engineering. So Scott, I will turn it over to you. Great. Uh, thank you, Professor Gibson, and good morning, everyone. It's uh, great to be with you. Thanks for joining us today. We have an exciting panel of speakers on prevention through design in the United Kingdom. Prevention through design is also referred to as construction design management. The UK is much further along on this journey than we are in the US. We have a lot we can learn from them. Our first speaker is Professor Billy Hare, Professor of Construction Management in the School of Computing, Engineering and Built Environment at Glasgow Caledonian University. He is research theme lead for the Built Environment, Deputy Director of the School's Center for Built Environment and Asset Management, or BEAM. Dr. Hare's presentation will view prevention through design through the UK lens, reviewing how the introduction of construction design and management regulations, or CDM, have shaped the designer's role in helping to manage occupational safety and health risks during the construction phase and beyond. Please go ahead and roll the tape. Good morning, everyone. My name is Billy Hare, and I'm Professor of Construction Management at Glasgow Caledonian University. Good morning, everyone. My name is Billy Hare, and I'm Professor of Construction Management at Glasgow Caledonian University in Glasgow, Scotland, United Kingdom. I'm also Deputy Director of the BEAM Research Centre, and that stands for the Built Environment and Asset Management Research Centre. And just a second, I'm just going to load up my PowerPoint presentation for you this morning. The title of my presentation today is CDM Innovations at GCU. But before I explain what CDM is, I would like to go over uh, the outline of the content of my presentation for you this morning. So I will begin with an introduction to myself and some background information before discussing the UK CDM regulations, look at some UK good practice before discussing some of my own research in this area, and then finally looking to the future. So first of all, the, uh, the BEAM Research Centre, of which I'm Deputy Director, is a research centre for the built environment and asset management. And it covers three domain areas, one of which is the construction, project risk and value management, for which my research area resides within. And my research portfolio covers almost exclusively 
construction safety, health and well-being. In addition to that, the university here, GCU, our, our slogan is the university for the common good. And as such, we have a strong link with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. So my research area covers research goal number three, good health and well-being, and goal number eight, decent work and economic growth, a subsection of which of decent work is safe work. And so these are the uh, SDG elements of which my research applies to. So moving on to the main subject matter that I'd like to discuss with you this morning, which is uh, the CDM or Construction Design and Man Management Regulations. Obviously, in the US, you have the philosophy of prevention through design. Here in the UK, we have strict regulations covering what you must legally do if you are a designer uh, undertaking construction work in the UK. So I'm just going to give you an overview of the CDM regulations uh, as they apply to the various parties of a construction project in the UK. Although we're looking at CDM 2015, uh, the regulations were first implemented in the mid-1990s, then updated in 2007. So we're looking at around about 20 years worth of regulation in the UK. It covers three main duty holders, the client, as you might say, the owner, the principal designer and principal contractor. Principal designer is the organisation or individual in control of the pre-construction and design phase and principal contractor of the organisation in control of the construction phase. If we look at the legal duties of the client here in the UK, you can see that the client has to notify the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive, your equivalent of OSHA. They must also put in place management arrangements. So these are specific legal duties to ensure that things get done. The principal designer and principal contractor are appointed legally and that the client must ensure through these management arrangements that they are all undertaking their legal duties. So the client must have checks and balances in place to make sure this happens, which is quite a significant legal duty on the client or owner. Uh, they also take receipt of the various health and safety documents at the end of the project to aid the safe use and operation of the, of the facility or building. The principal designer, which is the main focus of today, have legal duty to provide what's called pre-construction information, which is the information on hazards and any other health, relevant health and safety information to allow the project to be managed safely. They must plan, manage, monitor and coordinate other designers in relation to health and safety during the pre-construction phase and liaise with the principal contractor during construction when things change and new designs are needed to ensure that health and safety matters are considered. The principal contractor is like the mirror image of the principal designer, but of course in control of the construction phase. They must create their plan, which we call the construction phase plan, or CPP, on how the work will be managed safely on site. And likewise, just like the PD, plan, manage, monitor and coordinate for other contractors on site and liaise with the PC for the same reason as any changes or design changes are needed to ensure that health and safety matters are considered. And either the PC or the PD then must hand over the health and safety information for safe use and operation at the end of the project. Now that's a very uh, brief overview of CDM as it applies in the UK. There are other aspects to it, but that's all we're covering for now. Let's now focus on the designer legal duties. Now the uh, cycle on the screen you can see represent the three main aspects of the main designer duty under CDM, which is to eliminate hazards, reduce risks and provide information to others. In terms of eliminating hazards, the example on the slide is how we might eliminate the hazard of work at height by designing to allow window cleaning from ground level. So we've eliminated work at height. To reduce risks, the designer might incorporate uh, an edge protection, as the next example is shown, or barrier to reduce the risk of falling from the roof if one has to go and work on the roof and work at height. Then inform others is a duty to provide information on further 
hazards or residual risk to others in the project team, mainly to contractors. And in the UK, this is more frequently being done now through information on drawings, as illustrated in the slide there. So let's take those three elements of the legal duty on designers within the UK and just have a look at it in relation to what you might recognise as the McLeamy curve, uh, showing how the scope for change reduces and the cost of change increases as we progress through the project timeline, illustrated here by the UK's uh, RIBA plan of work, the Royal Institute of British Architects plan of work phases. So if we take that eliminate and the notion of eliminating risks, what has been shown here is that the most optimum moment in the project timeline to eliminate, for example, significant risks such as, say, contaminated ground, which might require changing the direction of a road or a railway track, or if it's a building, uh, a change in detail to the foundations. All this kind of uh, decision making needs to be made at the early concept feasibility stages of the project. Reducing risks. Once we've got a design and we start developing construction designs and construction information, that gives us something to physically look at and then attempt to reduce risks, such as the example on the previous slide of uh, the edge protection, for example. That's a risk reduction measure once you know what you're dealing with. And that is uh, on the timeline as the design develops. The final information provision, what's shown here on the timeline is that information is, of course, provided uh, throughout the project, but the latest point at which risk and, re and residual risk information should be provided is just prior to the commencement of the construction phase. And then finally, just as an additional note, it's not a good time to change the design during the construction phase. That incorporates more, more risk, and this is why we have this legal duty to liaise between designer and contractor as well. Because these are legal requirements and they are criminal law in the UK, we have the aspect of fines. Uh, and I just want to take a, a slight distraction here uh, to one side to consider this option of fines and in relation to how that impacts human behaviour. Uh, I'm quoting here on the slide from uh, an HSE publication uh, which discusses how negative reinforcement, and you would consider a fine to be negative reinforcement, produces just enough behaviour to avoid something unpleasant. So in other words, if you've got a fine, what you're going to do is invoke a behaviour to avoid getting the fine. However, as, as research and psychology in such areas let, lets us know, uh, positive reinforcement produces far better results in general. So how that relates to what I'm discussing here today is that fines, all you'll ever get at best is compliance. And what you want to aim at is really, if you want to change the culture, uh, as you might be looking at in the USA, for example, you might want to look at, say, incentives, recognition for good practice, and opportunities when you see good practice to provide those organizations with more work, which and according to the theory, will provide superior performance rather than just merely compliance. And the next slide I want to show you tends to illustrate what I'm saying there. What I have on this slide is, uh, is the kind of graph of fatal accident numbers over time from starting about the 1980s onwards. And you can see that the number of fatal accidents in the UK has dropped uh, from around about 130 per year average in the 80s down to about 40 per year in the current uh, time frame. I've overlaid that with the introduction of CDM 1994 and then the variation in 2007 before the final version 2015. I wouldn't say they particularly cause an impact on the reduction. It seems the reductions in fatal accidents are, are happening before the, the updates to CDM anyway. But what I want to do is overlay with one final aspect, and this is the introduction of what we call the sentencing guidelines in 2016 by the HSE. Uh, and what this meant was it resulted in an increase in the amount of fines from 2016 onwards. So the year prior to 2016, total fines for construction were 18 million. And then after the year after to the introduction of the sentencing guidelines, 
the total fines for a similar number of offences rocketed to 72 million. That's quite a staggering increase in fines. But compare that to the overall rate uh, or number of fatal accidents. It has remained steady. And even after the, the dates on the graph here, in recent years, even with the pandemic and other factors, they, they have stayed relatively stable at 40 deaths per annum. So what I'm saying is this increase in fines has not had any desired effect on the, the number of fatal accidents. I appreciate I'm not showing anything else up, such as ill health or terminal illness, but looking at this as one example, um, it seems that what I've said in the previous slide seems to be true, and maybe we must look to some other way to influence culture other than just these fines. Having said that, uh, I do want to make uh, one final comparison before I leave this area between the UK and the USA. In the UK, our population is about 67 million and of that, about 2.4 million are employed in construction. In the USA, it's around approximately 330 million and 10 million employed in construction. So looking at the two populations, that's somewhere between four and five times what we have in the UK is what we have in the USA. And if we have 40 on average fatal accidents per year in the UK, then if we multiply that by somewhere between four and five, then we would expect the US to have somewhere between 160 and 200 deaths per annum in construction. And those of you who are in the United States right now, before I put this figure up, you will probably already know what it is. And the actual figure is about 1,000 fatal accidents per annum in the US. So in other words, about five or six times the UK figure. Uh, and there must be a reason for that. So is it the UK legislation? Is it the way we deal with fines? Or is it some other factor such as culture? I won't answer that question just now. I'll just leave it there. I think that's a good discussion point for later. But it is also an extremely good area for further research, which I'd be quite happy to speak to any US colleagues about if you're interested in. OK, now let's look at some CDM good practice here in the UK. Um, we have an organisation made uh, predominantly of architects known as DIOHAS, uh, and that's an acronym for Health and Safety and Design, Design Initiative on Health and Safety within the UK. And DIOHAS has produced some really good guidance on their website, and the web link is on the screen for your information. I'm just showing you some. It's, it's not necessary to be able to read that, that uh, matrix I've just put up on the screen, but it's just to give you an idea of the type of guidance that's available on the DIOHAS website. This provides RIBA type um, language to designers on how they can incorporate CDM um, legal duties into their design processes. They also have guides like the next one I'm showing you, which is another matrix based on a framework which is produced here in the UK under something called PAS 1192-6. Uh, and, and that uh, rather forgettable reference uh, is in relation to how we communicate health and safety information within building information models and such like. And I'm also going to refer to this when I talk about my own research. And what this is, it's a matrix that uses images, imagery to help convey hazards and designer influenced actions that can be taken to reduce the risks. Uh, and again, these are all guides on the Biohas website. And they also provide useful examples as well of the information communication using symbols and such like on drawings as well. So a very useful resource. And speaking of useful resources, uh, I don't have time today to talk about these other ones as, uh, in more detail, but there are guides as shown on the slide here from uh, organizations such as ICE, uh, the Institution of Civil Engineers, and uh, other organizations uh, headed by HSE and the Construction Industry Council. So I'll leave them there for you as signposts to other useful relevant information. You probably heard a little bit about BIM today uh, or yesterday, and, I, uh, and I'm continuing that because I'm going to look at BIM myself. But uh, before doing so, I, again, I just wanted to uh, draw your attention to some other very useful guides. Uh, if you are interested in prevention through design and how that links with BIM, then these guides in the UK are also quite useful. So again, I'll leave them there for your information. 
But all the good things that said about BIM and some that you might have heard today already, uh, this is my scepticism that I have, and that is that, that BIM, as planned, is very is very colourful and uh, and shows you great flyovers and walkthroughs, such as the image on the left. But the reality can be quite different, and and BIM seems to forget about all the all the various hazards in the photograph on the right hand side of this slide, which which is the reality for me and why I've I've been quite um, quite reluctant to adopt uh, BIM and health and safety and prevention through design as I have done in the past. And part of that is because I'm not so sure of its usefulness uh, depending on who is using the BIM software, for example. And that brings me to my next slide, which was the first piece of research I'd done in this area. And it was through that skeptic skeptical view that um, BIM is not the silver bullet when it comes to health and safety. Uh, and this project, which is on the slide, uh, was an attempt by us, our team, to ascertain if site-specific experience had an impact on your ability to identify hazards when looking at BIM models. So the theory is that BIM models can help you visualize where hazards are and result in better management of health and safety. Um, so what we did was we wanted to test um, the ability of designers to identify hazards in BIM designs. So our PhD student, Graham Hain, developed a BIM model, a fictitious BIM model, with uh, around about 60 hazards that we incorporated into the model. And we basically asked designers, can you spot the hazards by viewing the model? With 47 final year engineering students, some of which had some work experience and some of which did not and 13 practicing engineers, some of which had site experience and some of which uh, had an entire career in the office and, and no site experience. And that was the, the main comparative groups that we wanted to check. The way we checked this was through a hazard perception test. So we I asked designers to identify the hazards, but also how the hazard could be eliminated. And we were able to rank the responses using the hierarchy on the right hand side of the slide there from one through to five, and the best option being elimination through substitution engineering controls, administrative controls, and, and the lowest point, PPE, being a five. So um, the next slide I want to show you is the results of that category one, the best options, elimination of hazards. And what we found was that students with no site experience um, could only identify nine hazards that they could eliminate, whereas 20 hazards were identified and eliminated by students with uh, site experience. And the same phenomenon happened with our experienced engineers. And so these were roughly equal numbers of each um, type of designer. So that it's not that there was just more of the, the designers with site experience. Uh, they just identified amongst them more of those hazards. So that gave us the the green light to go ahead and do the next phase of work, which we did funded by the Institution of Occupational Safety and Health, which was the development of a tool to try and plug this gap. What we did was, again, we produced CAD drawings, incorporating hazards into the drawings, and we had two groups this time, an experimental group who used the digital tool that we developed, which I'll show you in a moment, and a control group who just merely had access to the internet. And we, again, we uh, measured their uh, before and after their ability to identify hazards. This is just an overview of the digital tool that I was referring to. So with this tool, it's, in, it's, it's aligned with the uh, PAS 1192-8 framework and that it identifies the hazards aligned with building elements or um, construction processes, and then provides you with alternative options uh, based on the eliminate, reduce, inform hierarchy. This is just some screenshots of the tool, how you can browse through or search the tool, and you can search by building project type, building part, or site activity to allow you to uh, go between this and drawings to, to identify if there's hazards and, uh, identifiable from the BIM model or the drawings. And these are just some examples of the, uh, you know, the the options, the alternative options to eliminate or reduce risks 
as well. So now to the results of that. Uh, what you're looking at on this slide here is, is how many hazards were identified overall by the experimental group on the top set of bars and the control group on the lower section of bars. The bright red is the additional hazards identified as a result of using the tool for the top group. And the bottom group has far less, almost zero bright red dashes, showing that very little additional hazards were identified without use of the tool. Uh, these are the average or mean hazards identified using that same data. And the brown or maroon card lines are the experimental group using the tool. And the red lines are the control group using merely the internet, Google search, etc. And you can see, and these were statistically significant differences before and after use of the tool. And I've also split it down. We had new graduates and we had experienced designers. And what we found was that the new graduates saw bigger increases in their number of hazards identified using the tool. Experienced designers also had an increase, but not to the same effect. I'm now showing the category scores in terms of their ability to eliminate or reduce or inform. And what we found again was that the greatest scores were for those who used the tool. These graphs this time I'm now splitting between architects and engineers, which showed that engineers identified more hazards than architects. But both groups also found, as you can see in the graphs, found that the tool resulted in statistically significant increase and their ability to articulate how they might eliminate or substitute or reduce the risk better than they did without the tool. To finish up there, I just want to say that uh, if, if you think that you want to get involved in the development of this tool, then I'd like to, to meet up with you at some point in the future. The tool at the moment is just a prototype. The database itself is very limited. And what I'm trying to do is grow that database it uses visual aids, so with photos, images, and other documents, which then can go into the BIM or CAD software. And what you didn't see in the slides was that these are also aligned with the the, the codes or, or the, um, uh, the sequences, numbers, and such like, that allow all that information to be integrated with BIM software, uh, which has also been developed as part of that project that I've shown you. So if you're interested in that, uh, and you think you may want to do something in the USA, then I'll speak to you later. So some key takeaways from the presentation this morning, signposted you to some uh, good resources. So please seek out that new knowledge and guidance for yourself if you're interested in prevention through design. Only use the technology if it helps you. Uh, remember that visual representations do help, and I am an advocate of that. But as uh, the findings of that research showed, there is no real substitute for site experience. But please, at the end of the day, please share your good practice and, of course, reward good practice as that does reap the rewards better than uh, fines and, and, and punishment. Thank you for your time. And I just want to finish off by showing you this view from my bedroom window in Scotland. And I hope it gives you as much satisfaction as it does me. Thank you.